Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, hello, wherever you are, welcome. We are very happy to have you back from a uh, hopefully very relaxing Memorial Day weekend for you. I am Chris Short, Technical Marketing Manager at Red Hat on the OpenShift team. Uh, I am joined today by two fellow Red Hatters, uh, but quick some, some, some quick housekeeping. Uh, keep in mind for our folks uh, joining us on Zoom today and on Twitch that this is a public event and this will live on for perpetuity. Even on Twitch, we are going to pull it off and uh, once it cycles out, we will have it on YouTube. So it will be on the internet forever. So please uh, keep in mind that, you know, we have a, you know, code of conduct of sorts, you know, for the, 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 the Twitch stream that we're on. Uh, they have a community code of conduct. So please keep that in mind. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know in chat. Uh, with that, we are here for developer experience office hours. I am not the expert on this. So we have two of my very favorite fellow Red Hatters, Serena Doyle and Jan Kleiner, and I will let them introduce themselves. Serena, take it away. Sure. Hi, my name is Serena, and I am the product manager of the developer tooling area. And um, I recently switched. I was the UXD lead until about two weeks ago. So now I'm switching over to product management, but still representing the same product. So um, welcome. I'll let Jan introduce herself. I'm Jan Kleinert. So I'm here from our OpenShift developer advocacy team. And I think we may have a few of our other team members in the chat. Mm. Yeah. I need to mention one more thing. Uh, we have several team members in chat, actually. Uh, so um, but feel free to fire away your questions. But also, you might notice uh, during the Starting Soon banner or anything else uh, that we have a follower goal uh, set up. Uh, we are trying to hit 1,000 followers for the, the, the Twitch channel by the end of June. So please subscribe to Twitch. Uh, join us on uh, the Red Hat Twitch or Red Hat OpenShift Twitch, and you know, sub subscribe today. Help us hit that goal of 1,000 followers by the end of June. Uh, with that, further ado, please take it away. Okay, great. Um, so today, you know, we have our office hour. I think last last meeting we had in April, we talked about starting to do these every two weeks. So. Um, and on Twitch, so we're excited to be here. Um, and as you guys know, we our OpenShift developer experience office hours kind of uh, like we, we try to demo what's coming up, open questions for any uh, questions on what's what we're showing today. Um, today, what I'm going to be showing is I'm going to be demoing what's coming in post 4.4. So I have um, a cluster that's got like the latest um, code on it, and I'll be demoing what's coming up soon. So I'm also going to add a, a survey into the chat. So as people kind of listen to us and after the, the office hours complete, if you don't mind just letting us know how we're doing. Um, so today, if you, you can see my um, screen, I'm showing you the OpenShift console. And uh, what you'll see in post 4.4 is that we've made some navigation changes. In the last meeting, I think what we did was we shared the designs, but today we're showing, sharing the actual implementation. So in the navigation area in the developer perspective, so I think most of you probably do know this, but there's a way to change between the administrator perspective and then switch over to the developer perspective. So as a developer, we'd assume you're gonna be in the developer experience most of the time. So um, in this area, you'll see three kind of main buckets in the navigation. Uh, the first bucket is kind of task-based navigation. So we've moved some things around, but we have the ad page, topology page, our monitoring section, and search. The second section is more object-based. So you have builds, pipelines, helm, and project. And then the last place is a new area that we've added, which um, we allow users to add and remove resources to the navigation, because this is something that we were asked for in the past. So um, for example, if I wanted to search for pods, I can take a look at pods here. And when I do a search, you can see over here on the right-hand side, I have a link to add that to my navigation. So I can click on add, and then you'll see it down here. So then, so now it's really easy for me to be able to go from project to project and be able to see all my pods if that's the, the resource that I'm, I'm most concerned about. Um, you can add as many items as you want uh, to the navigation. And then you can also very easily remove them by either using the search again, or you can also hover over this icon 
um, click on the remove icon and then just confirm that so it removes it from the navigation. So this is one of the things that we're hoping um, is going to uh, enable users to not switch back and forth from developer to admin perspective as, as frequently as we had heard that people were frequently switching over just to get access to things like secrets, config maps, um, pods, and other things as well. Um, the next thing that I'm going to just show is that ad page. So uh, if you have seen this in previous releases, you can see that we've now added more cards here. So we've added kind of shortcuts. So Operator Backed is one of our newer cards. And this is just going to the developer experience. And what it does is it just pre-selects the Operator Backed services. So that's what you're going to see by default. If I go back to Add again, um, if I click on Helm Charts, you get the Helm Charts selected by default. And we also are enabling um, you to click on a pipeline uh, card, which should bring us directly into the pipeline line builder um, and as with every demo sometimes things don't work so it looks like this one might be our time here that's not going to work but that's what that should be doing and then finally there's also an event source card and I will wait for a bit because I'm going to show you how that works in a little while um, we've also made some changes to our project page so we used to see I'm seeing a lot of problems here so let me see if I can just Refresh my cluster, there we go. Um, so if I select on project, what you'll see now is we have a project page that's got three tabs. We have uh, an overview tab, which is kind of like our dashboard. We have a details tab, which is the default details page uh, tab, which is showing just real details from the YAML directly into this page. And then we have the project access tab, which used to be embedded in like the more section inside the navigation. So as we continue to, uh, as I continue to demo this stuff, if you guys have feedback or questions, you know, feel free to put things into the chat and Chris will help um, moderate any questions. Um, one of the things that we're curious on is this project overview. So this is kind of a project dashboard, right? Um, and we're curious on what type of information that we're showing here and is this what people are really interested in seeing? So what you can see here is on the top left-hand side, we see the details card, um, which just has a, the name, requester, and labels. And then we show an in inventory card. And what this is showing you is the resources. And if there's any errors or warnings with these objects, you'd also see indication inside that inventory card. We then have a status card. Right now, this is just showing that the project is active. Like, so you might, if you deleted that, you might see that in the terminated state as well. And we're thinking in the, eventually that we're going to add things like application vulnerabilities or other types of items like that up here in the status card. Um, we then have a utilization card, which shows you some of your high-level utilization information. And um, then if you have any resource quotas that are configured, you'd see them at the bottom. And on the right-hand side, you'd see that activity card that allows you to see like, the most recent activities and events. So um, if anybody has any comments on that, again, put them in the chat. That would be awesome. And I am now then going to talk about health checks. So um, feel free to ask the, your questions. Sorry to interrupt. But yeah, if you have questions about anything that's going on right now or you want to slow down and go back to something, please let us know. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the topology um, topology view. And if I click on a deployment here, what you'll see is that we've now added health check support. So any deployment or deployment config that does not have health checks um, already defined, when you click, when you select that item on the right hand side of inside of the topology view or in the list view, you will end up seeing that um, this kind of inline notification stating that the health checks are not configured. So this now allows me to you know, go back in and say, okay, I wanna add my health checks. I can say I wanna add a liveliness probe, so I'll click this here. And as I scroll through that, I'm just gonna take all the defaults and hit check. And then I'm gonna say add. And now you'll see as I still have this item selected, my, um, my inline notification is now gone because the health check has been configured. 
So that's cool. The other thing that we can do is we can also, um, as we are creating objects or deploying images, importing from Git, et cetera, we have a new option called health checks. So as you're adding something, I could also say, oh, I want to add a readiness probe on this one and take the defaults and then hit create. And now we can see when I click on this item, also I don't see the inline notification. So that means that the health checks have been added. I also can do an edit health check as well. So that's this is the, the flow for either adding health checks afterwards, editing health checks, or um, creating them on the fly. All right, so we got a lot of questions here in chat. <laughs> All right, Serena. so yes. go ahead. Go Sorry. ahead, Jan. Serena, before, uh, before we jump into the questions, I just want to say how happy I am to see the health checks come back to the developer console. Yes. I think that's so nice not to have to do that with YAML, so. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks yeah. for making yes. that possible. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I am a calendar-driven YAML engineer, but I don't want to have to be a YAML engineer if I don't have to. Right. Um, so some questions here. Uh, Jan, do you want to field them or you want me to? Sure, yeah. Um, let's see. So the first one is related to um, projects and um, RBAC, basically. So what if the requester of a project left the department or company and we want to associate projects with a persistent business role? So what would be the best way to do that? Um, I might need more specifics to be able to give the best answer, but Serena, I think, you know, service accounts potentially could be helpful there. Um, do you have any other, like as far as under projects, the project access section, are there any other right. tips you have around that that would be helpful? No, right now, I mean, for project access, this what we've done here on this in this tab is we've tried to abstract away the concepts of roles and role bindings, right? So that's one of the things that we've really tried to do on uh, in a developer perspective. Um, so we don't have any answers for that that here, I don't think at all. Uh, what we're allowing people to do is just kind of have a few edit or admin role, anything like more complex than that. We need to go back over to uh, the admin side. Right. Yeah, and cluster admin is always gonna have access to all the projects and all the resources. So if you wanted to set up um, different you know, access structures that way you could. So they'll always have access to everything if you needed to remove access for somebody who'd left the department or something like that. It's interesting though, because it's almost like, I think what you might be asking is transferring ownership of a project when somebody leaves, right? Um, I think, I think that's what that means, but might be something that we can think about a little bit more on our end. Mm -hmm. um, the next question was around uh, the pipeline builder and the pipeline section in general. So the question was basically, what sort of pipelines are you building there? Is it Tecton? Is it Jenkins? What's behind the scenes? Yep. So and that's do you want to take that? No, go for it. <laughs> okay. So the pipelines with capital P that we have here is OpenShift pipelines, which is built on top of Tecton. Um, but as far as you know, what you plug into your pipeline is very, very flexible um, with Tecton. But yeah, that's that's what the pipeline builder there is built on top of Tecton. Let's see. I think there was one more question. I'm trying to follow through chat here. Oh, which version um, of OpenShift is going to have the add to sidebar shortcut feature? Is that four, five, four, six? So we're and when we're talking about, I think we're talking about um, the navigation the shortcuts. Oh no, oh, the, the navigation. Na oh, the nav shortcuts. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, those those are scheduled for four five, but not committed to four five yet. Um, but they are currently developed. So uh, the hope is that they'll be in four five or later. <laughs> cool. Uh, let's see. Let's get up here. New question. Is there a view on how large existing Jenkins should integrate with the new Tekton system? We can try and I can try and pull some links into chat um, that might be helpful with that. I don't have you know broad guidance, but I think we can point you to some um, references that might help. So Serena, while you're moving on, I'll try to 
drop something in chat unless my team okay. beats me to it. Okay, great. Sounds good. Um, so let me, I'm going to go on and just do a couple other small demos. So one of the things that people uh, frequently ask us is, you know, how am I able to change the logo inside of the, some of these items in, um, in the topology view? So for exam example, both of these uh, deployments here, I added by doing a deploy image, but they didn't know what the type of workload it was. So you are able to add a, um, a label to make this change. So if I add a label that's called app.openshift.io slash runtime, and um, let's say that I thought that this was Spring Boot, I can say Spring Boot, hit enter, hit save, and you can see that my logo changes uh, to Spring Boot. Eventually, this is gonna be something that we want to um, expose in the, into the UI as well, but right now, in, in you know, um, we do have this capability of allowing you to change that to Quarkus, Spring Boot, Red Hat. I'll also try another one here, which is Red Hat Spring Boot. Um, so, type all right there. Um, equal to Red Hat Spring Boot, and that shows me. I think it's called the Snowdrop icon. Uh, so again, like those two icons, uh, support for those two icons is now been added to um, 4.5. I think Quarkus, Quarkus is also 4.5 as well. So that's a way for you to you know, be able to annotate through labels and be able to actually see a visualization change inside a topology. Um, so this is nice for demos or even just so people understand you know, what the runtime of that um, image actually is. I see a... Um, there's a message question. that says our custom icons for the pods and services supported right now. No, that, that is not um, supported right now. We don't have it in the near term on um, the roadmap either. But it's that is an that interesting we, question, though. I could yeah. push that back to the UX team because we have regular meetings with them. Yeah. Yeah, that's I mean, definitely. I'm, I'm sure people would like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. We can definitely take a look at that for sure. I'll um, fire that message off right now. Okay, awesome. All right. So let's see. Uh, I am going to switch off now to talk about um, Helm enhancements. And let's see. So I'm going to go over to the ad page. As I noted before, we can click on the Helm chart card. Um, so this page is kind of a discoverability, right? Allowing people to understand how they can add to their, their projects. So if I click on Helm charts, it's going to pre filter the developer catalog of Helm charts for me. And some of the things that we've added here um, that will be available post 4.5 is if you look at this info page, you see this whole column on the left. This is new, right? So you can see the chart version, app version, home page, maintainers. You can see the email sometimes when it was initially created. Um, we also have more information like the readme file for this chart is here as well. Um, so all of this information, right, is, is provided by whoever's creating those Helm charts. So um, some you might see more than others. I'll go to another example here where I see this description. Oh, here we go. The description is there as well as the readme is there. Um, but then I'll go to this one here where you can see there's a lot, much, le uh, much more limited data that's shown. And again, that's because of whoever has published these Helm charts um, for us. Serena, question yes. about that that came up in the chat. So uh, the question was, where are those Helm charts loaded from and can we add our own? So correct me if I'm wrong, but so in 4.4, which is the release where Helm was added in the developer catalog, um, that these are being populated from a very specific um, repository of Helm charts. But in a future release, that setting of where you're pointing to for the Helm charts is going to be configurable. Is that correct? Yes, right now on the, well, we have on the roadmap for 4.6 and later, we have the ability to have multiple um, libraries of Helm charts. And we also have Rohit who is on the line with us. And I don't know if Rohit, maybe you could give us some more yeah. information around what we support today on yeah. 4.5. So right now we uh, support just one Red Hat supported uh, developer catalog, which is the Helm catalog that we see. And it's a curated list of Helm charts that we provide from Red Hat. And I mean, there's a bunch of onboarding criteria where 
if a Helm chart owner wants to contribute to a, a Red Hat catalog, they can onboard their chart on top of uh, our catalog. And then uh, for 4.6, uh, we have plans to support multiple chart repos, wherein a user could go ahead and, for example, add a Elasticsearch uh, repo to their catalog, and everything will work fine. Thanks, Ruby. There's also another question in the chat. Let's see, if the Helm chart's referencing public images, can we point them to the local the registry? Remove any external references? We are disconnected. Install. So I don't know if you have the answer to that. Repeat. No, chance. No, I don't have an answer to that. Okay. Uh, we Probably right. in later versions, we'll have support for disconnected support as well, wherein users so, will be able to configure their own. Locally. Um, I have I have thoughts and opinions here. We are working very hard on the disconnected install piece. Both uh, community and uh, here at Red Hat uh, are both working very hard on getting disconnected installs up to a point where they're easier, right? Like almost as easy as the online part. So it's a work in progress. There's a lot to it, obviously, when you have things like OLM and registries and the number of things that are needed for just OpenShift to just run normally. So there's significant effort. There's a work group that has been stood up in the CNCF community and we have been working on disconnected installs for a while here at Red Hat. So yeah, there's lots of work going on there. Great. Thank you. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna install one of these Helm charts. So um, in Right now, uh, when we're installing Helm charts, unfortunately, we, at the beginning, we're still using the YAML editor. That's something that you'll see change. We have on the roadmap for 4.6, I think, right now. We're targeting um, being able to change this to um, ability to create via form or YAML editor and be able to switch back and forth. But for, so for right now, what I'm going to show is installing this Helm chart uh, via YAML editor. And as I install that, you can see now we have this Helm release created here on the right hand side. I'm going to, I'll, I'll select that. And what you can see is I have three tabs here. I have um, Helm release details. I have the resources that were created by that Helm, Helm release itself. And if there are release notes available with that Helm chart, you would also see them here. Um, and again, that is dependent on uh, whoever's creating that Helm chart from the beginning. We now have the ability also in, um, or we will have the ability post 4.4, expected in 4.5, we'll have the ability to do an upgrade. Upgrades are really interesting because you can upgrade a Helm release by either changing the chart version, but in this case, I don't have an, an additional chart version to upgrade to, but I could also, if I wanted to, um, you know, change the YAML and that would be considered as uh, an upgrade. So I'm just going to change something from false to true. Hit upgrade. <clears throat> and then what you'll see here is if I um, select this Helm release, you can see now if I go to Helm uh, revision history, you can see that I now have a revision.
Apologies, everyone, for the technical errors on my part. Uh, we are back at it here and off and rolling again. Take it away, Serena. Okay, great. Sorry about those technical difficulties there. So what we're going to do is go back to um, the Helm chart. I'm not really quite sure when we were cut off. So um, I, think I, I think I was able to talk about everything that's available on the info panel, et cetera. Um, but what I was trying to do was show you guys how you can do an installation of a Helm chart and that we also now um, support both rollback and uninstall and update. So I've just created uh, install the Helm chart. So I have a Helm release here. And um, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do an upgrade. And, and again, forgive me if I'm uh, repeating myself, but what I was saying is that an upgrade can be two different things. You can either upgrade by changing the version. In this case, I don't have an additional version. Or you can upgrade by editing the uh, YAML directly. So I'm just going to change this uh, value, enabled value of false to true. And what you'll see is when I hit upgrade is um, when I go back and look at the Helm release itself and go to the revision history, you can see that I now have a second revision that I've done an upgrade. What this allows me to do now as well is I can all, you know, at any time I can do a rollback. Um, but what I can do here since I'm sitting on the revision history tab is I see my number one revision. And if I had made a mistake, I could be like, hey, I want to go back to roll back to my initial revision because I just made a mistake during that upgrade or for some other reason I might want to go back. So as I hit uh, roll back, it does the roll back. So now you see I have a third revision available and it's now rolled back to that initial state. So that's a pretty cool feature that's been added. Um, and so I just showed you very quickly how we can do an upgrade and a rollback. And now we also have the ability to do the uninstall Helm release, which is very similar to a delete. We're just utilizing the same um, terminology as we have in, um, in a CLI. And because it's a destructive action, we ask you to confirm deletion by typing in the, the name again and then hit the uninstall and, and there it goes, it's gone there. So I'm gonna open it up for any comments or questions um, and just checking to make sure that, I, <laughs> that I'm still alive here. So I, I do you, see you're that. very like alive. We're still alive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, great, <laughs> awesome. Um, so if there's nothing else there around Helm, I'm going to now um, switch over to eventing. So event sources is something else that uh, we have coming post 4.4. And in order to create an event source, you need to have a, uh, a K-Native service available. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to utilize the import from Git. Thank you guys. Lots of you probably have already done something like this where you put your Git repo in. Um, it automatically detect detects the builder image for you. And if you continue to go through all these you know, defaults are set for you, but if you want to create a K-Native service in the resources section, I just click K-Native service there. <clears throat> we do have this ability to create pipelines on the fly if you want. In this case, we don't have um, a pipeline template available for the Python K-Native service combination, which is fine. We don't need that. I'm just going to create that K-Native service. Uh, if you guys have done this before, you probably know that when a Knative service is first created, it's waiting for that revision um, to, uh, it's waiting for that revision to, to come up and the pods to come up before it dis is displayed inside of the, the Knative service itself. <clears throat> Since we're going to wait for a second or two, what I'm going to do is, um, I'm taking a look over here to the right. Can you specify a pull secret in that form? I will show you this, yeah. So inside um, of the import from Git, you can um, you can hit the advanced Git options where you can either reference an existing secret or create a new secret there. So I think that would answer that first question. Um, there we go. And now I'm gonna just go back to topology, see if this revision is up yet, not quite yet. So it will happen in a minute. While it's going, uh, we had another question in chat asking if Tecton is replacing S2I. S2I is um, source to image, which is what is being used when you do that Git repo. Um, 
import and it picks a builder image, your source code and creates like the application image. Tecton is not meant as a replacement for S2I. S2I, you can use S2I as a task in a Tecton pipeline. Um, so they they very much can interact, but it, it's not a replacement for S2I. Okay. Thanks for answering that. Yeah, and something else that's been changed a little bit is on our Knative service, you'll see down here on the bottom left-hand side, we do have a logo uh, a, well, we call it a decorator that indicates if a build or a pipeline is associated with it. In this case, it's a build, right? So you can see that our build is just been completed. Um, if I wanted to, in the right-hand side panel, you, I, you guys probably might also know this, but there is a build section here. And if I ever wanted to kind of view the logs, there's a quick one link access for me to be able to, to click and, and view those um, build logs. And as it's, so we see here it's successful. So hopefully when I come back to topology, uh, uh, we're still probably gonna have to wait another minute or so, but it's getting there. We do have a revision, um, but the revision does not have uh, the pod associated with it yet. Somebody just asked what version of OpenShift is this? This is a, this is, we're running the daily build, which is, um, Let's see, I'm gonna ask if Andrew you're maybe daily, uh, yeah. go into I like you could show them right now. Go to okay. uh I'm trying to think where is it in this view. Actually just switch over to the administrator view. Or okay. yeah, and, and about it might show you. I, I'm not sure what it's gonna say. Yeah. Uh, so this is a four five build, but as yeah. I keep saying, expect it in four five because some of the features that might be here. Uh, might not necessarily be delivered, but um, this is what we're working on is daily and expected to go in four or five. Uh, let's see. Okay, so cool. Finally, here we go. We've got our revision shown up here. So what this means is um, I can now uh, add an event source. So let's hope I can do this properly. So I go to the ad page. There is a card called event source on the bottom. This is pretty cool. We now have um, a number of event sources that we can create through the UI. Some of them are form driven and some of them are YAML driven. Um, the first four API service source, API server source, container source, cron job source, and ping source are all generated uh, via form in this first version that we're um, releasing with these. And sync binding, oh, I'm sorry, sync binding is as well. Camel source, on the other hand, is uh, YAML driven. And in the future, and uh, on the roadmap, and for the, you know, hopefully the following release, we will have the ability to have form driven and YAML driven event sources, and the ability to kind of switch back and forth. But that's um, that's not yet uh, available. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to show you an example of creating a ping source um, where. Uh, I'm just going to put in some data. I'm going to add a schedule. The schedule, the schedule is um, the typical cron job schedule format. So I'm just going to put in five asterisks, which means this is going to run every minute. Um, the next thing you have to do is provide a Knative service or a, a service to sync to. Since there's only a single Knative service in this uh, project, it automatically defaults to that. So you don't have to worry about that. It also defaults to a name based on the type. So since this is a ping source, the name of this object is going to be ping source. I hit create. And what you'll see now is you've got my ping source right here, which is um, an event source that you just created. And it's connected to this revision. And this is configured so that in every about minute, it will kick off um, it, the Knative service will be accessed. So in about a minute, again, if we wait long enough, what we'll see is this will go from auto scale to zero to uh, and, and scale up to a single pod. So again, if there's any commentary that we can have, I don't know if anybody wants um, Jan or, or, or maybe Rohit, if you guys have any other dis discussions around event sources, we could uh, talk about that now. Although now I see it must have um, gotten that information and that Knative service is now scaling up. So if I click on this, 
Again, we can see zero pods right now. It is pending. And within another hopefully 30 seconds or so, that should scale up and be running. Let's see what happens. There is another question here around are there documents or reading available on how they interact in 4.4? Um, yeah, so you know, while you were doing this demo, we were kind of answering a few questions in the chat Perfect. around okay. um, Tecton and S2I and how, how you can use them together. Um, okay. We can Great. provide some other, other links to those, but just to be clear, um, you know, Tecton can be used with many, many other things aside from S2I, you don't have to use S2I with, with pipelines. Um, but if you are using S2I and find it confusing and are looking for more information around that, we can uh, we can try to drop some stuff in there. Um, if you have any way of clarifying the specific points of confusion, that might help us get you pointed in the right direction. Okay, and it looks like there seems to be an issue with this pod coming up. Um, so I'm not I sure. I like troubleshooting um, pods. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I do. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, can you click yeah. on events? Yeah, check yes, the events. I sure can. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Mm. Oh, it's getting stuff. Well, it's doing its thing. It's taking its time. Yeah. It's taking a while. Yeah, you know, it's off Memorial Day weekend. You know, it's taking a sweet time. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Do we want to let this do its thing and then yeah, we can move on to whatever was next and come back and check sure. on it. Sure. 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 Sounds great. Um, I know that I had tried earlier to click on the pipeline card here. I'm going to do it one more time to see. Yeah. Great. I think it's because um, there was just a, a glitch with my system here before. So um, I'm going to go back again and show. So from the ad page, we have added a new card, even though the pipeline builder was uh, introduced in 4.4, what we did, what we're doing post 4.4 is we're adding that new card here in the ad page to kind of, again, make it a little bit more discoverable. Because the other way that you can get to the pipeline builder is if you click on the pipelines um, uh, navigation item and hit create pipeline, right? So um, I'm gonna just do this quickly. Uh, I'll see, I'll, I don't know how many of you guys have created a pipeline before and um, you can create a number of tasks here. I'm just gonna, pick things by default, you can create either uh, parallel sequential or non sequential tasks, right. Um, and then as I'm continuing to add these tasks, you see that there's a, um, you see that there's a red exclamation point there, that's because there's missing resources for those. So if I clicked on the build a task, you could see here on the right hand side, that I need um, to add some import and output resources for that to be filled but there aren't any available because they there aren't any associated with the pipeline itself. So I would come down here on the, the left-hand bottom side of this form and I'd create a new resource of type git. Um, so let's say I'm just gonna say git resource and I would check the resource type. I'm gonna select git type and uh, then I'm going to go back here because there was another one, I think it was image. So I can add another resource, which is my image resource and select resource type here is image. And now if I go back to the build a task, you can see here, I can have a drop down that shows me, I can select my Git resource and I can select my image resource. And as I have done that, now all my required input is, is set and that exclamation point goes away. So I can now do the same thing for Git clone, right? So um, I have another, actually under parameters, I have a URL that's uh, required input. So I need to put a git URL to clone. I'm just gonna put something in there that's junk um, for now. And that's all I needed to do again. So my mandatory input is, is uh, all in. And now if I do this third task, you can see that I need to have uh, an image resource selected. So select that image resource. And again, now everything is all set. So I can, at this point, I can create my pipeline. 
And here you can see the, the format of that pipeline is exactly the same. So um, some changes that have been also added here are, um, we can now see the tasks that are associated with my pipeline. That's new in this 4.5 release or coming upcoming post 4.4. And we have the ability to um, add triggers. So I'm gonna take a look at that modal. So this allows me to put in a webhook. So it allows me to kind of, um, I'm going to ask Andrew. Andrew, are you still on the call? Yes, I am. Would you mind just talking through the webhook part for me to better describe it to the to the audience? Sure. So uh, the Git provider type here would be a selection that uh, parses the incoming data from your webhook. So if you go ahead and click on that and select the first one, uh, just for an example here, this uh, exposes some variables that you can use that we've uh, just hit on here on a little collapsible thing. Uh, these are all the variables that are parsed from the uh, event coming from your, your Git repo. And it, these uh, can be used in that format there that's uh, highlighted in that light blue. If you go ahead and make use of one of those uh, those guys inside one of the fields here. Let's see, what would we or, do? Revision or, maybe? I'm trying to think what which one would make sense. A revision there? So there's a, get your, there's a repo URL. Let's go ahead and use that one. Okay, let's do that. Okay. I think I can even do, uh, maybe not. I'm trying to see if I can do copy and paste, but maybe not as easy as I thought it might be. So let's just do that. And then that there would resolve when that event is, uh, is caught on our side here, it would resolve into the URL that that particular event had, which is the repo URL in this case. So if I want to now um, revision, I can just add in master. And in these cases, there's no Git resources and image resources that, so it's forcing me to create these, right, Andrew? Correct. If you had some, yeah. it would allow you to pick from those so you could reuse previous uh, created uh, Tecton uh, pipeline resources. Okay, okay, great. And can I just put in some junk value here for now, just so I can get through? the trigger and let's see what that does when I hit add. How does that make things change on this page? Ah, I see. So maybe you can explain this piece as well, Andrew, what yeah. the trigger template. Sure. So uh, there are many resources here for the, the Tecton triggers in order to make it work here. We create a handful of them for you in order to streamline the process so you can get right to using your, your webhook. This created a trigger template and exposed a URL that you could take to your, uh, your GitHub page and place in uh, the webhook interface on uh, your Git site to say, please invoke a, a post request to this URL when X happens on my repo, a pull request happens, a commit happens. And then you can trigger this, this new pipeline that we're looking at here when that happens. Awesome. All right, so, um, so now this has a trigger associated with it. If I wanted to, I could also remove the trigger uh, and I could also start the pipeline myself as well. So, um, and again, that is the start pipeline modal or form is it's really the same thing as the adding trigger, right, Andrew? The difference is that it just doesn't have the webhook section? Correct, so the, in order to start this particular pipeline, you have to answer some questions in order for it to fulfill uh, the requirements for it knows what to do. Uh, during the pipeline. So the same questions happen on both sides. One is just from a trigger and one is manual. Awesome. Thank you. Um, are there any other pieces that you think are worth showing here? Maybe uh, adding the credentials, I'm trying to hear. Maybe we could talk through some of this as well. Um, Andrew, when you do a start pipeline, we do have this new advanced option, right, around cred credentials? Right, so if you're, you're trying to access a private uh, repo, uh, you're, you're gonna wanna be able to authenticate it with the pipeline in order for them to have successful access of pulling from your, uh, your, uh, your private repo. So there's different ways to access uh, here. So if you select a Git server, for instance, if we're talking about our GitHub, uh, mm -hmm. and then you put in the, the, uh, the base URL that would access that particular uh, site, in this case, uh, GitHub. And then yeah. you pick how you want to authenticate with it. Um, you'd probably basic authentication, for instance, and then you just your username and password or the token that you have, and you just use that. 
I'm going to just type in something junk <laughs> <laughs> for now because I don't um, have it. Add um, that there. Yeah. Under the hood, we associate this to the needed pieces for the pipeline in order to make use of the secret uh, when it's running in order to pull from your, uh, your private repo. Okay, awesome. Any questions on that credential section? Because I think that was another piece that was requested from, from some of our users. I didn't see a question on that. There was a, a really good question on, is there a simple path to export all of this configuration? So all this pipeline stuff that you're setting up um, so that they can turn it into infrastructure, talking too fast, infrastructure as code uh, using Helm 3, for example. Do we have, I mean, whenever you're creating those pipelines, you know, you have all of the pipeline related YAML files, which are modular and reusable, but is there any other, Anything else you're aware of that might help people kind of just like click a button and be able to reuse this? So there are some things that we do uh, provide out of the box here to help out the user. Um, the ad flow, if Serena would like to mm -hmm. go into the from Git and we'll just use one of the deployment or deployment configs and make use of that flow there. Talking about this, I'm assuming. Yes, I am. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So with this, you, Andrew, I don't. I, I'm not sure where this stuff is added or how these things are labeled so that they show up here. But they're they're associated with the resource type in conjunction with the runtime, right, or the builder image. Right. So um, um, a, a little more detail around that would be uh, there's a. Uh, there's an OpenShift namespace project that you can go into and take a look at uh, the the operators created these these pipelines for reuse um, in order for us to just here. I'm trying to get over there. Yeah, <laughs> so it's OpenShift. Yeah, it's just OpenShift. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Thank you. So these are all the ones that uh, the operator um, installs on uh, the cluster in order to provide a easy access for the varying different uh, resource types and, uh, and builder images. And that's where that template is coming from. It's one of these. So I'm not sure if that helps the, the question that was asked, um, but that is people want to create default pipelines for specific resources. That is a, a way to, to provide that for your developers so that they don't have to do, they don't have to create those pipelines themselves. Yeah, I guess that's a little bit different than, um, than the question that we had in chat, but um, I, don't, I don't think there's something that's exactly what's being requested um, from the question in chat where you could quickly and easily export the application specific um, configuration or setup to be reused. But that is a really great, um, it's a really valid use case. So I think what you can do with the pipelines is whenever you're creating any of these, even when it's in the builder, what it's doing behind the scenes is there's basically YAML for each of these, for tasks, for resources, for pipelines, pipeline runs, all of that, um, that you can reuse. Um, that is one of the nice things about Tecton, I guess, but um, we don't have like a simple command or a you know click to export those things at the moment. Um, I may follow up with uh, InfoSec 812 to see if I can get a little more detail from you afterwards because um, I'd like to I'd like to talk about it a bit more. And we only have five minutes on here. Yeah, we can also take a peek into some of the. Um things that are on the backlog I, and see if there's anything like that that's on the backlog as well, for the, the roadmap backlog. Okay. Um, the, I think on the pipeline side, that's pretty much all I wanted to share. Uh, and unfortunately today I can't show the command line terminal. That's something that hopefully in two weeks we'll be able to, to demo um, feature right now and, this, and my cluster's not working but it's a pretty exciting uh, feature that is coming up uh, post 4.4. Um, and I think for now, that's 
all we have. I am going to again request if you know for those of you who are, are watching live or um, or watch the recording, if you don't mind, take the survey. I'll add the link one more time. That would be great. Let us know how we're doing, what we can do to make things better, what you want yep. to talk about in the future. Always looking for new things. Yes. Yeah. All right. Definitely. And cool. in the future, I think um, we also might be talking about some of the things that we're looking at for our roadmap for four six, and um, even like sharing some of the mockups that we have for some of those new features. So we'd really like to get people's involvement, uh, feedback, et cetera. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, you know, just given the amount of activity we've had today, when is the next time we're doing this? Two weeks from today, same slot. Same Two time weeks, slot. same time, same bet channel. Uh, yeah, so please join us here in a couple of weeks. We'll have more fun things for all the developers for OpenShift and, you know, all the other people too, right? Because we're all kind of in this together. Uh, thank you, Jan. Thank you, Serena. Again, apologies for the, the, the break in the middle. Uh, we'll make sure that doesn't happen again. And uh, I will see you all back here in a few minutes for OpenShift Commons restreaming. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.